start off, uh, I'll just give a little bit of a um, overview and perhaps a background on our speakers today. So Dr. Uiki Beng is a sinologist and a political biographer. He has done biographies of uh, people like Tun Dr. Ismail, Go, Sui, uh, Go Keng Sui, Lim Kit Siang and Yusuf Ishak. He's also translated several ancient war manuals from classical Chinese into Swedish and English. For example, The Art of War by Sun Zi, uh, Wei Lao Zi and also Wu Zi. Um, uh, Swedish editions were the first ever to be translated from, from classical Chinese into Swedish. And he's also the founder editor of Penang Monthly uh, Issues, which is Penang's uh, policy brief series, and uh, IC's Perspective by Singapore's ICF, uh, IC's Yusuf Isha Institute. And he currently serves as the executive director of the Penang Institute. Uh, Mr. Churo Peng <laughs> is uh, a Malaysian poet and also a columnist uh, for Chinese language newspapers. He has published uh, three volumes of poetry, uh, Love Sick, Speed Read, and also Vanilla. Uh, in terms of prose, he has published uh, Captain Suddenly and also a book on entrepreneurship. Um, he organizes the Dong Di Yin Poetry Performance, uh, which tours the country, and is also the winner of the Hua Zong Literature Award and Hai O Literature Award, and currently is the executive, executive director and founder of the Name Technology and chairman of Mentor Publishing. So without further ado, uh, I will pass um, the floor to Mr. Uiki Bing. Um, also in the course of his presentation and also this conversation, if there are particular points uh, which you would like clarification, I would like this to be more of an open uh, conversation where we are able to kind of um, add on to each other's points or you know, to, to have more of an interactive uh, session here. So please feel free um, to add on. You have the microphone over there. Um, I will also pass this microphone over to you um, to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, Maybe we can have one of the mics passed on to here as well, since a lot of our audience is over here. All right, so, yeah, probably not, because, you know, it's, it's a Friday morning, so <laughs> we do expect that the crowd would be a little bit more intimate this way. Um, so, yeah, please feel free. Uh, maybe you can just take it off the mic stands and, and uh, pass it around as you, as you like. Okay, Dr. Ui. Yeah. Yep. Please. Um, okay, good morning everyone. Does it does it echo too much or is it better without the mic? Do you, uh, can it, without the mic, can you hear? Uh, it's a bit too cold. Is it can can we do something about the temperature? Um, but also is it better for him to use the mic or without the mic? What what do you prefer? Can you hear well? Because from here I just I just hear echoes. <laughs> But it's okay? Okay. Uh, are you, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, sure. But uh, if, if in case you can't hear him, then just let us know. Then yeah, we'll use the yeah, mic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you've got no choice then. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome. Um, now, my, I suppose what I can contribute to a workshop on, on translation from, from English to Mandarin is not so much how, you know, the technicalities of doing that translation, but perhaps to, to, to raise certain issues that uh, perhaps are always in the background when one translates across civilizations. Yeah? Um, so I could start to, to, to give the context to what I'm trying to say, um, is that I, I was living in Sweden a long time and uh, I was studying ethics, of course Western ethics, yeah? uh, feeling very uncomfortable with it after a few years, which made me wonder why I was so feeling so uncomfortable uh, studying the, 
the ethical thinking of another civilization as well. Uh, and in the end, I felt forced to, to go to look into some other civilization. And the easiest one for me then was, of course, Chinese, although I didn't know Mandarin at all. But having been born and raised in Penang, uh, I assumed that the reason why I felt so uncomfortable studying you know, the, the philosophy of another civilization had something to do with the fact that I was born and raised here. So I decided to, to study Mandarin. And um, to cut a long story short, then I started. So, so my basic reason for doing that was not so much translation as to find out what the basic concepts in our thinking are that actually can be more different than we imagine, right? So that was my journey, really. That was what I wanted to find out. So I started to study Mandarin, and when you're doing that at 36, you can't expect to be good in Mandarin, really. It's a bit late. But, uh, what was, but it, it worked in the sense that what I wanted to find out actually was not what more modern Mandarin was. What I was interested in were... I was trying to identify certain key concepts in Chinese political thinking, largely, political and philosophical thinking, that that could be the reason why I found the, the divide between East and West so painful when it came down to the study of ethics and, and, and religion and all sorts of things. And that, that's where I'm coming from. Um, also, to make things more complicated, uh, my first translations of not, not modern Chinese, but classical Chinese, was not into English, but into Swedish. Yeah. And since then, I have tried to translate from, from classical Chinese to, to English. But in a way, that's done after I did it to Swedish. So, so there's that complication as well. Um, who, who does the switching? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Ma Chen? Ma Chen? Can we Can we start the... I, I, yeah, keep going. Now, um, now when I was told to, when I was asked to take part in this, in this, uh, this year's literary festival, and when I was told that there was something to, there was going to be something about translation, of course I wasn't quite sure whether I should take part or not. I wasn't, wasn't quite sure what, what uh, they wanted from me. Um, but in the end, it turned out to be a workshop, which is not exactly the kind of thing I, I would actually be, should actually be taking part in. But I thought my contribution could be to, to just share with you uh, some of the issues that, that were important to me as I, as I you know, went through my career here. Um, I, I do a lot of editing. I, I've done a lot of transcribing and uh, well, talking, of course, and all that. But what I would like to say is that to start off, that um, I see it all as a, a, it's all graded in a way, right? Editing all the way to translate, reading or whatever, all the way to translating, it's all sort of the same thing in a certain process. And what is that process? I think that process is, is a, an exploration of what meaning is. Um, what, we're, what we're doing when we're trying to, con what, when we're translating is to imagine that we can take some meaning in some language or civilization, digitize it in a way, bring it across a, a boundary, and then uh, make it understandable in that new civilizational context, right? Um, now, that is a very, very difficult process. And I think we tend to, tend to take it too lightly that something like that actually happens. And as... I mean, to say that something is lost in translation, translation is, is actually not saying enough. Mm. I think, I think a, a lot is lost, a lot is gained, a lot is recreated or created as the transference happens. We can, we can uh, see how, how serious the problem is even without looking at translations, even a simple conversation like what we are having here in this room. How do we know that we are actually understanding each other, right? Very often we don't even, we just assume it, right? And then it, it's never challenged, and so we, we leave here and say, oh yeah, he was interesting, or he was not, or whatever. Um, and then tomorrow we might have forgotten what was said and what not. So a lot of what passes for meaning and meaning transference, is, it's actually not, it doesn't go in at all, right? Um, and I take that to be a big problem, especially in modern living, that where we, we take on meaning very superficially. It's just to 
get through the day, get through the job, pass the exam or whatever. Um, and yet I do, I'm totally convinced that there are deeper layers of meaning in, in, uh, in human communication. And, and the, the less time we have and the, the, the more we are cosmopolitan, strangely enough, the, the more we tend to be rather easy. We take it a little too easy with the transference of meaning. Yeah. Um, so in the end, I would say what I've learned all these years is that, well, what we call for understand, what we call understanding or knowledge, is, is all very tentative. We we shouldn't ever be sure that we, we we know what the other guy is talking about, or what even what we are talking about, you know, because there's, it's always a dialogue. So I'm saying something, and if the crowd were different, um, my un what the crowd would understand of what I'm saying would be different if you know what I mean. So it, it's always a dialogue and that means it's really, really tentative. And, um, and the, the role that inspiration plays in the listener's head as I speak, I think is not something that we, we, we highlight enough. But what I mean by that is that when I say something, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to mean something. And then you, you in your own head hears me, uh, hear me and then uh, you, you put things into it. There's always something you're, being, you're putting into it. And what you're putting into it depends on your state of mind and your, your emotional state at the moment. So in that sense, what I say, although you didn't quite understand it, it might have inspired something in your head, right? So when we talk about something being lost in translation or even in dialogue, I think we are being negative. I think should, we should always think the other way as well as we talk, something is being added on. That's what we mean by dialogue. So same thing with translations. And I think this, this, this turn of phrase to say something is lost in translation, I think, I don't quite like it, if, if you know what I mean. It, there's always something being gained. Uh, and it shouldn't be that important that we get exactly what the other guy is saying. You know what I mean? That's not what dialogue is about. I, I don't need to get exactly what you're saying. I just need to get what I need from what you're saying. If, if you know what I mean, yeah? If, if you know what I mean, yeah? Um, it, so, so meaning is always, the, the transference of meaning is always tentative. We don't know, you, I don't know what, I might think I'm not a very important person, but then I can go talk to some important person and I drop some hint. Some, I say something that's a bit strange and it inspires something in him because his mind is active. And, and that's, I, I, think, I think that's quite clear in dialogue, in oral, to, oral talk, right? I think it, it could be the same or it probably is the same also in translation and in text, especially in, in, in when you're reading about other civilizations. And uh, what I thought that I had stumbled into that was important was that since since I wanted to know how Chinese thinking was, searching for some essence which I think might not be there, but you know, you, you start looking for what's more central to Chinese thinking, and that was, that was what led me to look at ancient Chinese thinking more than modern Chinese thinking. And anyway, when, when, when I was doing that, it, it was in the late 80s, communism was still around, so modern Chinese thinking would be quite obvious, political Chinese communist talk, so that was the thing I avoided which forced me to, to look at ancient texts, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, next, next one, please. Yeah, I think that that's what I've just talked about. Um, now, trans, translating, I find, what, what I do want to say is that, um, when we, we, when we problem, problematize translations, we are already very far down the road. We, we, should, be, we should be thinking about what, what meaning is, what transference of meaning is. In that context, I would like to just throw in one, curios, one curiosa. Uh, in, in the Swedish language, the word for a sentence and the word for meaning is the same. That, that, that takes some thinking about, right? Uh, that is one of the examples that I find when I, when I move be, between, between languages, that suddenly you get notions that seem very strange. 
and I find that the, the most it's it's you know it's it's the most exciting thing for me whenever you you go into a new language and then you get a concept that doesn't fit, uh, and yet you, that's where you have to go looking further into it. What what did they actually mean, and what is the context in which that something could have meant something? So the exploration goes very deep. That's what I mean about meaning being very superficial and all the way to an extent where we might not even get it after looking years into it, you know. And that's what makes it ex exciting, really, right? Um, so it's, it's that movement, really, be between what, how superficial is the meaning or is there something else hidden there if you keep looking at it. Um, now, to, to, look at, to look at classical Chinese then was added a, a, a deeper dimension to everything, to me anyway, in the sense that uh, you're looking at a dead language, dead, almost dead anyway, dead language, um, and so there's, there's no one to really contradict you. It's all a conversation I'm having between my modern life and what could have been meant in, another, in, other, in the lives of the ancient, not only in you know, not only in a different time and different space, but in a different civilization totally. And with that, I want to also make the point that we cannot assume that what we call Chinese culture or civilization today is the same thing as what it was 2,000, 3,000 years ago. We probably don't quite understand what was meant by Confucius. We, we, we think we do, but then, you know, if you, if you look at the original text and how people might try to translate it into different languages, you start to see that, well, we're, we're not, it, it, there's nothing given here. It, has, it is something, the meaning of it perhaps have to be recreated for our own use or for my own use at this special point in time, yeah. Um, yeah, here, yeah, that I'm, I'm trying to list what, what all sorts of things that happen uh, as you as you try to pass on meaning. I was looking at what translation meant just yesterday, you know, after, after putting the, the talk together, and I thought I, I don't even know what the etymology of translate is. So I looked it up. Translate is Latin, of course, and it's to go a trans, going across, and late comes from lasio, meaning transference. So it's. Translating is supposed to mean the transference of, of language, and you, immediately you see how difficult that is. Now, in, our, in the ICT world today, the digitized world, we, we seem to be able, we, we've got Google Translate nowadays, right? Um, so we're, we're, we're at a point that it might be the mistake of thinking that the transference of meaning is easy might start to spread about among our young people. Um, but we do know that um, that, that is not an easy thing. Um, we can transfer, in, in a global world, we can get the sense that we can transfer meaning at a rather superficial level. What I would see, see as global English, if you like, uh, you know, that, that's, that has its own collection of, uh, of, um, of phrases. We could call them Americanisms or whatever. And young people who, who who are not English speakers, who want to learn English, they will probably start by learning those phrases, and then they'll use those phrases, and then they get by. They meet an American on the street and they talk to them. You see that a lot in China, right? right. People who are trying to learn English, and they'll meet someone who speaks English and they'll want to talk to them, and then there seems to be some kind of conversation going on. So there is, there is, it, there is communication at that level, rather digitized, I would say. Which, which brings me to my, my favorite dichotomy that when we transfer information, very often, we, we do a digitizing first. And then in the digitized version, they, we pass it on. But in digitizing, we, we get rid of a lot of uh, analog, analogical information. It's just like recording music in a digital fashion. Certain, something gets lost, we say, right? Lost in translation. But you take something out in order to make it more transferable. Uh, but the, the, the trick in that, the art in that, is that you, you digitize just enough and then you move it across and then you put other things in. You, you add something else in there. So what is the analogical information that is taken out is hopefully put back in, in the new context, right? Um, now, 
in, if there is no difference in time, if we're doing it uh, with the modern text that's written today and we publish, we translate it into Chinese, we may sense that, okay, we, it might work quite well. But then if, if it's in, from another time, the, the problem becomes astronomical. Yeah? Um, and that, that was what was what really interested me in the end to, to, to look at it. Uh, so I tend to think, can you go back one slide? I, I tend to think that interpretation is, it, it happens all the time. We, 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 we never do anything without interpreting it. So even if I talk to my wife, she's interpreting something, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> too much pain. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't communicate that well, is what I'm thinking, but the trouble could be that there's a gap between us not really communicating and us thinking that we do, right? And on a daily basis. I'm, I'm just trying to problematize the whole thing, and I'm, through, I'm, I'm sure I'm exaggerating the, the problem. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, we, we don't really understand each other, that, and we should live with that, you see. The trouble, the, the thing is that we seem to have such high expectations of, of information transference. Uh, I, so, I think one should actually lower one's, one's uh, expectations on that. Um, especially in the, in, when we're globalizing everything. We seem to think that, you know, humans all have a brain and therefore they have the same operative system somehow. We don't. We really, we really don't, right? Even if we're in from the same culture, even if I'm from Penang, you're from Penang, our OS, different versions, <laughs> and different, you know. And we, we only find that out as we come closer to each other, right? Uh, when we, when we're just friends who meet on the street, or even as working colleagues, you, you do seem to get along to a certain extent. But then you also do pick who you're gonna have lunch with, and who you're not gonna have lunch with. And we might think, ah. Uh, our characters, the chemistry doesn't work, so I prefer to, to be with this person or that. That's, I suppose, one way, of, one way of phrasing it. Another, of course, is that we very quickly sense that the, the OS is different. You know, I can't really, I don't know what to say to this person. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of thing. And yet that person obviously has friends of his or her, her own, and they seem to talk very well. Their OS seems to be closer, you know. So I'm, I'm saying the communication isn't, the difficulty in communication isn't always just language difference or civilizational difference. There, there are all sorts of funny things going on at the same time. If a, mark, a more Marxist interpretation is, would be that, well, it's also class. If you're from the same class, just because you're from London and I'm from Penang, if we're from the same class in some way, we seem to communicate better between the two of us than between me and someone in Penang of a different class, because the life experiences are different. And so life experiences would mean that you pick certain words to use, right? Because you want to express and capture your own experiences. Um, and so all along the way, you build up your own discourse, as, uh, as it were. That could be based on not only language, but on your class, on which part of town you come from, which dialect group you come from, so all that. We are really diverse, is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, we are so diverse that we should, we should be surprised that we communicate at all, in, in a way, yeah? Um, and so we do a lot of interpreting, a lot of goodwill, is, is what I'm getting at. A lot of things are communicated because we have goodwill. If you don't like someone, anything he says is going to sound wrong. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> Uh, you, you need goodwill, and once uh, goodwill is destroyed, like old, old friends losing, losing trust, then it's gone. Then he can say the same thing as he said to me yesterday, but today I'm not listening. Something has happened, you know. Um, so that, that searching part, that emotional part, that philosophical searching part that, that is always a part of us, I think is very central to, to any communication at all. Um, yeah, I think more or less that is what I want to say for the, my first part. How much time do I have? Uh, well, I, I thought just for the fun of it, um, and since to make it look like I'm, I'm actually speaking at a workshop, <laughs> um, I, I thought through, throughout my academic career and my, 
my interest in philosophy. Um, there was one basic word that I actually used centrally in my uh, PhD thesis, so I thought I, I could use this chance to, to, to talk about it. Um, and there have been two or three occasions when that word, or Tao, you know, Chang Tao Tao, had, had come into my own thinking about political, Chinese political thought and modern political thought. And so I thought I could go through, through that and tr perhaps try to show what, what the options were in interpreting these terms, you know. Um, now, to, to, before I start, um, I, I was studying political philosophy a lot in, in the West, in, in Sweden. Um, and one thing struck me, and that was that here we are talking about Western ideas, and that doesn't go far, all that far back, especially modern Western ideas. Huh? They don't go all that far back, but we give them a certain cogency because obviously so successful in, in many ways, and also because they're scientific, tied to the scientific revolution and all that. But it occurred to me also that we are talking about the organizing of societies. And in Asia, we have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years, and therefore there would have been all sorts of concepts that people would have come up with that, that would have been useful to those who were thinking about political organizations, be it in India or ancient China and whatnot. And, but because of the, hege the hegemony of Western thinking today, we seem to think that somehow they were wrong and not relevant. And I couldn't accept that in the end. You know? So the, the closest thing for me to do was then to, to, to a limited extent at least, try to look at certain key concepts in ancient Chinese thinking and through them, try to get an, an inkling at least of what that world might have looked like and which parts of those notions are transferable to the modern context, especially to modern Asia. Can I study Malaysia by using certain terms that the Confucians used? You know, that, that was where I was coming from, yeah. Um, but to today, today, I thought, uh, based on also my, my dissertation, I'll show you the cover of my dissertation. I called it this, yeah. Uh, could you go to that? Um, the further, much further back, sorry much further in front. Um, go on, go on. Oh, in front, in front. I mean, back, go to the back. Go on, go on. Go on. Ah, uh, this one. Uh, that's, why, that's why I called it. Um, now, this, this was the, the result of what, what uh, that exploration I was going on. Um, have, 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 do, do, you, do you guys know Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci? No? Of course you do. Gramsci was an, an Italian communist, I suppose, who was jailed, and while she, he was jailed, he wrote a lot of letters. And what came out of all of that was the word we use today, hegemony. Right? His, his main point is that our minds are actually quite controlled in ways we don't even know because they're controlled through, through not only terms, but through a network of ideas. Uh, so in any state, um, society and state, of course, huh? always together, um, there are certain notions that are common to all of us that goes through either through your family or through school and whatnot, and that's why you can communicate. So in Italian, seems to understand another Italian better, and it's not just the language. It's just the as assumed political concepts, right? And so if I can control that, if I as the state can control that set of notions, then I can more or less see where, how you guys will be thinking, the people will be thinking, and I can control where they can oppose me or not oppose me. Um, in, in the bad sense, that's what I would say schooling is, right? Schooling is also brainwashing, yeah, <laughs> in a way. So in, in this case of Malaysia, we're all stuck into this CMIO stuff, Chinese, Malay, Indian. So we go around and we see races all the time. And then a foreigner comes in and says, what's wrong with you people? You keep seeing races. And then you look at them, what's wrong with you? Don't you see races? <laughs> right? We think that's, that's a given. And 
yet this foreigner doesn't seem to get it. He doesn't get it because he didn't go to the same school, he doesn't read the same, he doesn't use the same notions to the same extent. There is some, he understands the words we use, but somehow those words don't seem to be so central to his thinking. You, you know what I mean? So there is that hegemonic world that we live in. And that was more or less what, what I wanted to say, want to say with, with the word Tao here. So, um, well, I should be controlling that. <laughs> it's hard for me not to. Um, okay, can we go back to, to the start of part two? Thank you. Okay, now, um, okay. Um, How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. I'll, I'll try to be very fast then. Yeah. Now, um, most of you would know what the first sentence in the Tao Te Ching is, right? Right, Tao Te... Next one. Tao, Tao Te... Next one. Uh, next one, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, Tao Ke Tao Fei Chang Tao, Ming Ke Ming Fei Chang Ming, right? Um, I mean... I'm, I mean, this is something that, that I think every one verse in Chinese would, would know. And so would probably not, not look further into that. But somehow this, this phrase always ex excited me, partly from, from this Gramscian point of view. Uh, now, the Tao Ke Tao here is the way. Right? We, we translate that the way usually. Rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure. I, I think it might be wrong, but Tao Ke Tao, the, the Tao speaking, right? So whatever can be said is not the eternal Tao. So it's the Chang Tao. Lah. So the, the key word here is not so much Tao as Chang, I think. Or if you want, you put the Chang Tao together, right? Now to me, um, so I, I try to go back to what Lao Tzu might have been trying to say. Um, and there are reasons why Taoism in this form and Buddhism very quickly in history became partners. And that, that was what I found exciting. There is something, there is a problematizing of language here. Problematizing of language. Language is a problem. Now, the idea of language being a problem, you do not find in most philosophies. Even in Western thinking, that problem came only in modern times. Language is a problem. It's not about which concepts are true, which concepts are not true the way Plato and all the others would have taught. It was only to me, it was only in modern times in Western thinking that with, with Ludwig Wittgenstein, really, if you ask me, where you know, he turned everything around and, and to show that philosophy is not as profound as we think. Philosophy is actually superficial. What is profound is that we should realize that, we are, we, we, that language which we created is not always just neutral, it has a very bad effect on us as well. And there you see the connection to Buddhism. That if you look at how you're thinking and what the concepts you take in, they're not neutral. Nothing is neutral. Nothing is neutral. So you get to the point where if you're looking to, to know what the world is or describe the world, the Chang Tao, right? If you think you can describe the world and you describe it, you've missed the point. That's what the, the sentence is saying. You know what I mean? So that is, it's, it's problematizing the distance between language and reality. So anyone claiming, and by claiming you use words, right? Claiming a truth has missed the point. That, that's sort of what, what, what it's all about. But, uh, to, but we do live with words. We do live with words. So what I want, I want to interpret that it as is that the Chang Tao shouldn't be seen as this, this true discourse. Um, in political context, you don't need a true discourse. You just need a discourse that's accepted by enough people. Right? And then you've got it. You've got it already. People are, people are regimented enough. You just want them regimented so that they, they, you can you know, control, control in a neutral sense even. Right? Um, so that, that was how I, would, I was trying to interpret that. Um, I think I might be running out of time, lah, huh? But, but just, just to, yeah, don't mind. But just, um, yeah. So this, this is one way of translating it. There are many, many, many ways of translating it. You, you'll find that on, on Google, really. Um, but so I won't have time to, to talk so much about it. In, uh, I would instead go on to the. 
I keep <laughs> switching here, and I'm imagining I'm switching there. But, um, I would like to. Well, maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't even talk about the slide since I can't control it from here. <laughs> um, where are we now? Now, when I was translating the Sun Tzu, just just to add, just to add on to 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 my my point, that uh, things are really more complicated than we always imagine. The next slide, please. Um, Oh, this is this is in in Swedish. Sorry, but um, now the in in the the word Tao does appear very few times, once or twice in the Sun Tzu, uh, where you see in the middle part. The first is oh, it's in Swedish, so I can 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 you what's the next page? No, I don't have it here. Then now I'll I'll try to translate it. Now uh, the can we see it from here? Yi Yue Tao, right? Can you see that? In the middle, in the sixth line, Yi Yue Tao, Er Yue Tian, Er Yue Tian, San Yue Ti, and all that. All translated over there I'll, in Swedish, but I'll read it out in English, right? The first is conviction, the second is the weather, the third is the terrain, the fourth is the general, and the fifth is the organization. Now, these, these are what the general needs to do when he plans, right? Now, the, the last four, I think may not be very controversial. Most people would, would translate them more or less the same way. Now, the first one, if I look at all other, in, all other translations of the, of the Sun Tzu Ping Pa, um, the Tao would be the way. They would call it the way, or some of them won't translate it. They might just call it Tao or something. Um, but given what I just told you about how I understood Tao, uh, as something between Tao, the way, and Tao, what is sayable, um, I thought I would try the word conviction. Um, so the general, as he plans, the first thing in his mind must be he must be, he must be, focused, he must be convinced of what he wants to do. He must have that uh, conviction. And from that conviction, then he can plan according to what the weather is, according to what the terrain is, according to who the general is and according to his structure. Um, and I thought, I might be wrong, of course, but this is my, my own conviction, that um, to, tr to just call it the way, it actually doesn't tell us anything, right? It, is, it doesn't tell us. To, to say, it's not even translated. The first, the first to think of is the way. So it, we start thinking religiously, and yet it, nothing comes to us. We actually, so we skip that line. And I think that might be the most important line. Um, so I, I to, to, to sidestep that problem or to overcome that problem, I, I chose conviction. And I, until today, of course, it's personal. I think that might be quite close in that it, it goes somewhere between the way pointing out some, some path and also what is sayable. So conviction, I thought, from, a, from a, uh, an English language point of view, might be something that can connect the two meanings of Tao in this, in this context of the Sun Tzu Ping Pa. Yeah? In other contexts, of course, that vague word will shift in, in other ways. Um, so, well, to end, so I, I, I would, uh, the, the workshop or the, this concept, I would, I would just simply say the Chang Tao is actually this hegemony that the political system needs to push into you. And in the Malaysian context, why I thought all that, that notion up was to suggest that actually in any political system, you need to have hegemony, but you only need sufficient hegemony. If you go too far, you start eating into the fringe. And any society lives a lot, gets a lot of inspiration from the fringe. So there's a balancing that somewhere in any political society that actually works. You have a certain amount of regimentation, a certain chang tao, uh, but don't push it too far because then it works against itself. Um, yeah, I think I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uri. Um, so, right, I think uh, maybe we would continue on with uh, roping. Yeah.
Hi, uh, my name is Ro Peng. Ro Peng, Zhou Ro Peng. Yeah, uh, it just, 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 just for fun, you know, the Tao and the Sun, Sun Zi, uh, the first time, because in the context of war, the first is Tao. I, 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 I personally, I might try the word righteousness, because righteousness, righteousness. yeah, because righteousness also, also leads to the conviction in general. It, it is a possibility, you know, just, just for fun, just trying it out. Okay, uh, a bit about my background. I'm a writer. I, I, I write poetry ch in, in, in Chinese for 20 over years. Um, I, I have always wanted to uh, let more people, more readers, read what the, the, the Malaysian Chinese writers uh, or poets writers, what, what they have been um, writing, creating their work. So I'm very, very interested in, in trying to translate Chinese po uh, poems into English or Bahasa so that, so that more people, more Malaysian people know, uh, can, can, can know uh, what we are writing and vice versa. That's, that's my goal, but I'm not a professional translator. Uh, just so happened that I'm quite okay with English. So when, when, when the time arrives, when the circumstances call for, I, uh, me and my brother were usually chosen to take the task, to take up the task to translate these work. Now, uh, doctor said that um, a lot of the times when, when, when you, are, you, you are listening, you are not really getting 100% of what the, the, the other person is talking about and you don't need to, uh, you, don't, you just get what you need. But when translating, when I'm doing translation for my friend's uh, fellow writer's poem, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, I, I believe, in this case, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not dialogue, uh, direct dialogue with uh, anymore. I'm, 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 I'm using my friend's work as a base, I'm translated, translating it into English. I think I have the responsibility to, to stay as close to his original meaning as possible because I'm translating his work. And at the same time, uh, it has to, the, the end result in English has to be poetry. It has to be beautiful. So it's tough. This is it's, it's a pretty tough work. Uh, I'm not here to provide any good solutions to these challenges, but m more as uh, to bring up, to share with you guys the difficulties that I have faced when, when, when trying to translate these words, uh, and, and I'll show you some examples later, and maybe let you try something that is totally impossible. Uh, okay, so, uh, some of the some of the, do all of you or most of you speak and write Chinese here, Mandarin? No? Yes? Yes? No? Okay. So, just to gauge what sort of things I should. Uh, one of the things um, about uh, Chinese language is, um, you know, that, that words are not just words, no matter whether English, Malay, Chinese, you know, it, it, has, a, it has a vast cultural background behind those, uh, those words, those mere words that really, really challenge you to challenge the, the translation effort. I mean, just for example, the, 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 the Chinese idioms, 成语, that we use, just to throw a simple example uh, that I've been attempting recently, uh, 海纳白川, do that in English. Someone, please, how do you do it in English? I mean, on the, on the, on the literal level, it means the sea, all embracing sea, where the, all the rivers are flowing into the sea. But it's not talking about that. <laughs> it's not it's talking about the ocean. It's talking about uh, 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 having an open, like the, 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 well, the prime ministers in the whole world, you, with an open heart and open mind, you accept all all notions, all, all, all ideas, and all the people, 
I mean, it's, it's just four, four, four Chinese words, which is so simple and concise. Uh, if you want to make that into English, it's a headache. And some more, some more when, when these, these uh, um, idioms, sometimes they're dismantled and used in Chinese poem, it makes it even, even harder to, to do that. Uh, and in, in Chinese poems, a lot of times we use uh, well-known ancient stories. For example, we can use uh, we can use uh, two words, Chu Han. You know, the, it, it, dynasty. Uh, I mean, the the the, the how, how should I, how should I put it? Chu Han Zhi Zheng. No. In English, would be the 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 Chu country, the Chu state and the Han state. We can use these two words and immediately call up the the notion of war and uh, antagonism, fight, battle into into us. But to to put that into English, it just sounds weird. It immediately sounds weird because it's it's lengthier. It's, uh, and the reader, especially those not that familiar with Chinese history, is gone. It immediately adds several layers on top of it. So that's a, that's a big challenge there. One big, this, another big challenge um, when, when trying to translate um, Chinese poems is how we handle homophonous words used in Chinese uh, poem, ch poems that often present double meanings. There are not many English words that, oh, I can, I can maybe, maybe Shakespeare, I remember my school teacher gave me this, this, this uh, example. Uh, I'm the repairer of soul, where, where soul would mean shoe at the same time means soul. In, in Chinese, this, this happens all the time. For example, that the, uh, a very old poem, Dong Bian Qing Shi, Dong Bian, Dong Bian, where the, where the word qing, it can mean a sunny day, at the same time it means love. So there's a, there's a lot of these double meaning words uh, in, in, in Chinese poems. This, this kind of technique is frequently used. So if you have this example, how are you going to handle the word qing? Are you going to translate it as a, a sunny day? Or you... Do you directly present the real meaning of the author, which means love or emotion? And if you do that, you totally destroy the, the fun in it, you know, the, the taste. You know, the, the one that they don't say it directly, but you get it, but the reader gets it. Oh, this is what you're saying. Uh, if you translate it directly, you give the direct meaning, that's gone. That part is gone. That's another tough thing, to, a tough thing about... Um, I, later, I have an example which is, which is full of homophonous words uh, written by a, a fellow uh, poet named Louis Yokto. I hate him. You will see why I hate him later. Because I have to translate his, his poem. And another thing is uh, word play in Chinese. There's a lot of, in Chinese poems, we, we, we play around with words a lot. And if you translate them, the cleverness might be gone. And I'll show you about this in the following examples. Perhaps I can immediately... There, there are several challenges that, uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about when, when I have more. we do have time. Good. Maybe we can look at those examples first. I, okay, this... No, the, okay, it's, it's written by uh, Mr. Louis Yokto. Now, let's look at the title alone. The title alone is, is, a, is a nightmare. Uh, those who can read Chinese would know, 未来城市之时装表演. Okay, the, the way, the first word, 未, 未来, is supposed to mean future, but he substituted with a word that says taste, 味道的味. 时装表演 is supposed to be the, 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 one, two, three, four, the fourth word from the last. It's supposed to be used the word time, uh, fashion show, 时装, but he replaced that word, fashion, with food. Why is he doing that? 
because he's writing a poem entirely about how the modern people um, nowadays are obsessed with food. We are Instagramming our food before we eat it. We are taking, we are telling our friends what nasi lemak, you know, all these things. Uh, how 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 uh, we are we are we based on our 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 travel our tour on food where we want to go uh, all these things uh, we can okay now we can begin to look at that uh, I believe it's a challenge to read this I need glasses hmm anyway I think it might be easier if I walk closer to the to to the screen. <clears throat> Now, uh, this poem was performed in Tong Ti Ying. Uh, it's a poem, it's a, it's a, we call it a poetry theater, theatrical poetry show. That's why I, I, because it's really my intention, I, I really want people who are, who are not Chinese literate to also be able to get a sense of what, what this is about, so I, I offer to translate uh, this. Uh, okay. I, could you read it? Are you able to read it? You, you, okay. Maybe you can you can just take a look at it and then later take a minute to look at to to read it and then I point out the the really really tough and weird parts that I have to have to choose whether I want to translate the meaning or or be, be literal about it. Okay, this is all about food. Some, some of the challenges that have happened like around here. You know, the is the Shi Qi the Shi Qi is playing with the, with, with the, 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 the homophonous words again. It, it's supposed to mean the, to, to, it sounds like Stone Age. But here, no, he's, he changed the, 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 the word stone with the food. Essentially, they sound the same in, in Chinese language. So he's talking about, he's not talking about the, the, the stone age, but actually the food age. So what am, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, this, is what, this is what I do. TV is the evangelist of the culinary era. So this is what he, I chose to present what he meant. What he meant, but the cleverness of his wordplay is lost in the process. So, uh, this is one example of the challenges. In the next slide, please. Okay. You can, you can take a, a, a few seconds to, to, to go through it. Some of you would not be able to read the Chinese parts. Okay, uh, next one. Next slide, please. Another example that he's, he's playing with, uh, with uh, the word play. Fashion, he replaced it with, uh, with food. Uh, next one. It's quite long, so it's, I hate him. Okay, another, another part on the, the, the third line, Fangfu Dong Zheng the Shi Zi Jun. It's supposed to, I mean, it sounded like uh, the, the Crusaders. The, Crus the Crusaders. But then again, Shi Zi Jun, the, the word Shi is at the same time, it still sounds like it, it, he replaced that with food again. So it's talking about a crusaders of people hunting for food, not fighting a war, hunting for food. But, but when, when, when the, this, at least I can still use the word like crusaders, the words like crusaders, so it's not too far away from, from what he's trying to convey. 
仿佛东征的十字军 swarmed every city like crusaders and began their little tours. Uh, still manageable. Okay, and these are other examples. Now, the the the, the another another example. 实行了时装味觉丰满的一生。实行 suppose implement to implement. Then again, uh, he replaced the word to implement with food again. So if I were to translate it, it's it's it's, it's nearly. It's, it's nearly impossible. I could only do it. I can only use the word "fulfilled," and "fulfill" their fashionable taste-filled life. Uh, I could only use the word, but but this then again, the cleverness in his original write, writing has been lost. I I chose to convey the meaning because there's no way I can use the word "food" or anything like that in English. Next slide, please. Now this is this is the worst part. Uh, I read it to you once, okay? The Chinese part. Like and one in, come recite after me. The, the Chinese part sounds like this, okay? Shi 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 and if I wanna, if I'm to, if I'm to give you the literal meaning of it, it uh, the shi it means a, a stone built room is wet, and somebody is wiping the room. Then he tried to eat ten lion bodies, about ten bodies of lions, and while eating them, then. Only then he knows that oh those are lions, actually uh, those are really lions. So he vowed to tear them apart and eat it like that. Believe it or not, all those things that you're hearing, it means all these things. However, how am I going to translate that? So what you're seeing here is just eat, 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 eat everything. I, I did that. Because uh, after some, first of all, it's not possible to do it in English with just one sound and means all these things. This is impossible. So the original meaning of the the author, as I, as he's a friend, as I could anticipate a guess, is that he the the real emphasis is just the word eat, because it all sounds shi eat food, everything like that. So, I compromised. This is what I did. That's what he what he's trying to mean, but not the wiping the stone room, everything like that. It's not really that's not really the point. The point here is food. That. So that's why I hate him. <laughs> that's a challenge. Okay, let's look at uh, 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 another poem by uh, titled "Trapped" by Mr. Chen Linglong, also a good friend. Now this is this is this is less uh, not as much crazy homophonous word word play, but I uh, it's a very good poem. You might want to read it a bit. Uh, what I want to highlight the most is the second line, and the second line. 比如人生，呃，这阵子想很多。比如人生是不值得活的。Notice that second line, okay? And I've thought of many things recently, such as such as life that was not worth living. Okay. And the next slide, please. This is the second paragraph. 这阵子想很多，比如不值得活的人生。Go back one slide. 比如人生是不值得活的。Next slide. 比如不值得活的人生。Same words, different arrangements. They mean different things. In this case, I've thought of many things recently, such as life that was not worth living for. Let's go to another slide. Next slide. 
这阵子想很多。比如活得不值的人生 ，different arrangement again. The meaning is different. I have thought of many things recently, such as living unworthily. I try to use the word "live" and "worth" as much as possible, so that I stay loyal. Loyal. My keyword is loyal to his wordplay. But then again, it's just not as clever as. The original one, original version, because it's just four words. He's putting them, playing them around, and and convey three different kind of meanings. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, go back once. Go back. Go back. Go back. Okay, that that is my um, my. Uh, we have about fifteen minutes left, right? Okay, good. So that that is the 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 the. the Tough parts when when tra translating modern Chinese poems, some of those challenges. Now, I would I would tell you a, a bit more about uh, some other tough points that that we we faced when trans translating Chinese poems. Another thing is is rhyming. Rhyming is an is an issue. Uh, if the original version, for example, this uh, this is an uh, abstract from my from my own work. Wu Yun 早已说得很清楚。在气象局的屏幕，当一个个翘脚的官员正谈论下午茶的去处 ，it rhymes 楚木处。So, but when doing in English, do you want to keep the keep the rhymes? Do you do you want to? Do you need to? That I don't know. Do we need to? This I don't have an answer for this. Do we need to? It'd be nice if you could, but it's hard. It's hard. And. Here's one of the, and sometimes when when、uh, the, the modern the modern Chinese po、um, uh, poets when they write they also make use of the form, the characters of、uh, the Chinese characters how they look like, It, be, because you know Chinese characters they they form from、uh, what, what's the what's the term, ideogram, ideo, ideogram, yeah, it's from images, so they play with that as well. So we are supposed to, to、um, give that, give everybody and some sort of exercise. Everybody, everybody try to translate that, and、uh, it's kind of like exercise for everybody, lah. So I chose this. Next one, please. Translate that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a pretty famous poem. I simplified it a bit so that it will fit. By、um, in a fit in one slide is a poem by a Taiwanese poet named Chen Li, very well known because、uh, it, it contains of only four words. The first word, the first paragraph, you see "ping," which means soldiers, soldiers, and then the second paragraph, it looks the same, but they're not.、Uh, it's "ping pang," "ping pang." Uh, let me just point it out for you. The second, for those who knows Chinese, you know that it's different.、Uh, these are missing. What do you call this? 少了一撇，少了一捺，所以是乒乓 And the final one missing, missing both the bottom parts. This is chill. What he's trying to present, what he's trying to hear is. The the title is 战争交响曲 the orchestra of war. So, this is like an army, a well, you know, laid out army going to into war. At the end, they are missing their legs because of the、uh, because of the war, injured injuries, everything, and become a mess. Maybe they lost the war or something, and at at the end, this is a. One of the clever, cleverest part, Chiu. Chiu is a.、Uh, these are tombs. They are all dead in tombs. Is、so、what what it means. The word also means. So he's playing with the the form of the character as well. So I. <laughs> how, this so some things are not to be translated. Not meant to be translated. Just leave it at that. So if we. <laughs> so some things are just impossible to to translate. Put it that way. 
another challenge is uh, I do not know how to you how to do uh, say this in English. That means we, when we write poems in, in, in Chinese, we use Chinese words to kind of like emulate the sound that the thing that we're describing. Okay, you just give me one example, you'll immediately understand. Uh, a late poet, uh, Mr. You Chuan, who was a good friend, Yu Chuan, uh, he has this, I'll give you one or two lines only, easy. He has this uh, poem called Gu Drum. There's, there is this line say, Gu Sheng Geng Zhong Geng Tong. It literally means heavier and more painful. Geng Zhong Geng Tong. But it also sounds like Geng Zhong Geng Tong. Geng Zhong Geng Tong. So using that to give you the sound of that. But at the same time, it means heavy and pain. So that this is something that is, it, it won't work in English. Heavy, pain, heavy, pain. It, that doesn't work. <laughs> Another poem that is, uh, is called Xing Shi. It's talking about the lion dance, the Chinese lion dance. And he's using the lion as um, to, to, to talk. The, the poem talks about uh, Chinese infighting, infighting among those different NGOs, you know, different different groups. You know, talking about the Chinese, the infighting among Chinese. So this is line. There is this line. Sing la, sing la. Oh, it has awakened. Okay, sing la, sing la. 却醒在斗抢斗抢的锣鼓声中。斗抢，斗抢。You, you, if you have seen, you have seen, if you have seen lion dance, you know the music is. If it's if you, if you can call that music, uh, 抢，斗抢，斗抢，斗抢。We we all know that, right? But he's not using that sound. He's using 斗抢 Literally, it means fighting and robbing. Fighting and robbing. So, but it sounds the same. Dok dok chang, dok dok chang, dok chang, dou chang, dou chang. The luo gu sheng zhong. So it's again, this doesn't translate well into English. These are these are all those clever word plays in Chinese poems. So, uh, so these are the these are the major some of those big challenges. Examples. So we have limited time. So. If you guys are interested in translating a poem from Chinese to English, I would suggest you do this. Next slide. <laughs> if you're, because if you translate this, I'm going to perform it two days later. Then I don't have to translate it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to perform this in, 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 Mandarin, in, in Mandarin. This is a poem. The first line is also the title. Uh, it's a poem that I wrote for, to raise fun for uh, the flood victims performed two days ago uh, in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. We raised about 200,000, by the way. I'm very happy about that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. With, with, with Long Xue Hua Tang. So tomorrow, uh, two days later, I'm going to perform this. So if you... It, I, I did not choose a, a, a outrageous, really difficult to translate poem. I, if you, I don't know, Yana. What, what do we do? Do we do we translate this or? Uh, yeah, I mean, if um, I think it'll be interesting if you would, if the audience would like to try translating, and then perhaps we can just have a really short discussion on what you thought were challenging, and we can probably have a feedback session. Is that something you'd like to try? Yeah. It doesn't have to be on paper as well. I mean, you can just pick out what you observe from this, just running it through your mind, perhaps. We can do it together. It has not been done yet. Then we compare your version and my version and see how, how, how our translation works. I can read it to you once if it's too difficult to, to, to see. I want to eat chocolate and laksa. 每年总有这样的时候，抽几天
循蜿蜒的道路北上，这个岛屿的海风有福建味的味道。我的朋友领着我穿梭老街，寻找那佝偻的身影。看他如何把岁月草香。一场骤雨淋湿了行程，像要一次说尽家国半世纪的牢骚。熟悉的道路渐渐隐没，水位爬过孩子的小脚，像他们不明白的恐惧，冷冷的爬上大人的心头。再多的祈祷声也压不下那一再升高的噩梦，直到半生耕耘，尽在绝望里头。而这一些，乌云老早已说得清楚。就在气象局的屏幕，当一个个翘脚的官员呢、啊，正在高谈阔论下午茶的去处。阳光迟迟不来，大雨终究停息。冷言冷语，竟是垃圾般浮起，腐臭如蒸棍的良心，淹过我向往的气味，污染美丽的家园。而我的朋友呢，正站在污水中央，看不到明天的方向。我吃不到草龟吊和拉沙，人生嘛，难免有这样的时候。今年总该换我了，领着我的朋友。穿过阴霾的天气，重寻晴天的方向。Thank you, thank you, thank you. So this is something that that I I need to be translated. <laughs> What?、Uh, oh yeah, I I did. Any thoughts on on、uh, if you were to attempt translating this? Perhaps、uh, the audience would like to bring up a few issues, maybe or some paragraphs, some sentences, some words that you might find you would have difficulty with, or interesting observations, perhaps. Okay, questions or anything that、uh, we've discussed so far in the session would be welcome as well. Actually, I find it interesting because a lot of、um, our discussion has touched on the difficulties of translating from Mandarin to English, simply because there are some elements within the Chinese language、um, that is simply not transferable, as you say. But would you have any particular difficulties from translating from English into Mandarin? I mean, would there be particular issues within that? Do you find? I didn't do so much of、um, translating from English to Mandarin,、uh, partly because I can read English. No, not because of that, but just no. no there's no such、uh, opportunities yet for me、mm. to to do that.、Right. Um, and a lot of people can do that already,、right. but not the other way around、uh, in Malaysia. So can't 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 talk much about that、mm, from English. Yes.、Yeah. Uh, yeah, I call. I'm Chao Shan, Chu Shan. Yeah, I'm Binang, Luke. Yeah, I always translate English to Chinese. <laughs> I but I always face some problem because、uh, we are Malaysia Chinese, right? But Malaysia Chinese some word is different with the、uh, the Chinese word in China or Taiwan. Yeah, for example, I I, I never translate the classical Chinese lah, but I always translate because I'm journalist.、Uh, translate like some article or press list from English to Chinese or some Malay from to Chinese. But for example, like English to Chinese, because I face some problem when I translate after I complete my article, because I ever study in Taiwan, so I know many fans in Taiwan or China or some in Hong Kong. 
when I share my artic uh, the Chinese article after I trans complete my translation to my friend in Taiwan or China or some in Hong Kong, they don't completely understand my article because like some for many simple words like market, Malaysia Chinese call pasa, we translate to pasa. Pasa is actually is, is Malay because we are multicultural, right? Because we know call market chai si chang. In China or Taiwan, they call chai si chang. The, for them, the Chinese in China or Taiwan, they, they, they mean the Chinese chai si chang is a correct word to translate market. Like for example, like Malay kampong. Kampong, we always tra translate to kampong, but not uh, xiang chun or jiao wai. So I always face some problem when I want to share the article, the Chinese article, when I translate. After I complete my translation, I share to my friend in Taiwan or China. They don't understand what I mean. Pasa, uh, what is mean? Kampang, kampang, yeah, yeah. So I face some problem like this. Can you share your experience? Well, today, today. I just published a book in Taiwan. This is the first day the book is in the market. Yeah. Uh, that book, when I wrote it, uh, is a series of uh, comp uh, columns, co articles. I, I wrote it with a clear mind, clear target. It's going to be 100% Malaysian. So, it had. I don't care about the China market. I didn't care about the, the Taiwan market. I, it, it contains words like fa lan zha. Can you understand that? Of course you can, right? Fa lan zha. Uh, it contains words like uh, what other things that you didn't understand? Okay. Um, what, are, what are some other things already? Okay. But then, then when they showed interest that um, to publish this in Taiwan, I had to correct all these things that, uh, into something that they, they can understand. So, it's more about how you define your target readers. So, if you are working for Malaysian readers, who cares about them? <laughs> we don't care about them. So, uh, I think it's perfectly fine to continue to use our kampang, Basa, I think it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we have our own standard. We might not be uh, our population might not be as many as, as 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 them, but we have our own standards here. However, uh, it's all about it's all about some some kind of awareness of uh, the, the 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 language that they, that they use over there. Because I read China, I, I read Taiwanese books. I sell them, but. I basically, I'm, I'm aware of what, what, are, what are the differences in phrases that we use, that the nouns we use here and there. De si, ji chen che, gong jiao, things like that. Or, 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 for in, 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 we call it, we call jing cha here, police, but then in China it's gong an, all, all these different things. We're aware. So if I'm writing for a, that target audience, I would, I would switch, switch channel you know, and think that way. This, we, we are good at that, uh, Malaysians. <laughs> So, it, got, it all comes back to your target audience. I, 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 I never thought that... I, 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 because if you write something like Chai Si Chang, then, uh, then Malaysian, Malaysian readers will find it weird. So, you, you, you got to decide who you want to please. Lah. Yeah, Mr. Chi, I found what you, what you said earlier very interesting about when you reminded everyone about how well, we're here we're talking about English and then Chinese, and which refers back to what I was saying about a trans civilization or what, where, where the problems all become very obvious, right? Uh, when, when it's close, like when between Taiwanese Mandarin and Malaysian Mandarin, the problems can be solved through a certain awareness. But when it's that jump, and then you have your ping pong and whatnot, it's, it's, it ends there. That certain things cannot be transferred from Microsoft to, to uh, Apple. It, just forget it, you know, sort of. Uh, but it, it, in the human context, it does, sh it does show that there are a lot of worlds that we might not be able to penetrate, and we, we somehow have to... Yeah.
Yeah, you, you, you're totally right. Uh, oh, some, some of, some of some, some unsolved problems, just to share with you guys. Uh, uh, the late poet Yeo Chuan was also in advertising. He, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, in charge of one of the Carlsberg uh, slogan. The, the English slogan was, come up to Carlsberg. And he's very good with the, the Mandarin. He couldn't come up with one line that... Could anybody think of one line that is close to that? Because come up to Carlsberg, it, it has an inviting feel. And it's talking about up, Carlsberg is better than everything else. So when it comes to Chinese, it only means... It comes up with something like that. It simply means enjoy this beer. The, 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 the meaning is lost. Come up to Carlsberg. It's gone. And not too, not too long ago, Guinness... Why am I just bringing up beer advertisements? Uh? I'm not really a... Anyway, <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic. For example, Guinness. Uh, this, that, 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 that campaign angered me quite a bit. Uh, remember Adam something, the Guinness, there's this, there's this cool guy you know, doing mountain uh, 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 hiking and jumping parachute, blah, 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 all sorts of things. Uh. All those cool things that became very rich, Adam something. You know, the, the slogan says, Adam can do it, why not you? In English, okay? So it has a meaning that, in English it means that you can do it too, right? But when it does it in Chinese, it did, it did a literal translation all over the newspapers. How do you feel? It's like your mom scolding you. Ah, yeah, my neighbor, uh, Aka, already become lawyer. Why not you, huh? It's, it's, so it, has, it lost the original English meaning saying, why not you? It means that you, you can do it too. But in, in Chinese, you don't do it that way. It, 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 it literally, is correct. Why not you? Why? Wei he? Not. Bu shi, you. Ni. They match perfectly. But the meaning is just different. It's, it's like the, the neighbor example I gave. So if I were to do it in, 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 in Chinese, to make the slogan right, the advertising right, uh, I would do it something like this. He bu ni lai. Then, then it has an inviting feel. Like, why not you do it too? And then this is an inviting feel. So, yeah, the literal, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's different. That's a challenge of English to Chinese. Yeah. Oh, and then, the, sorry. <laughs> One of the best um, motto or whatever that I use to encourage myself when I'm in, deep, in, in all sort of deep trouble huh, is the what is the best I can do now? I always ask myself this question whenever I'm in, in, in deep shit. Okay, okay, I'm already like this, like this already. What is the best I can do now? I couldn't find a very powerful Chinese translation for this one simple line. So, oh. 我现在最好能做什么? Gone. The inspiration gone. So that's another thing. So I talk to myself in English in such, such situations. Um, do you want to add something, was it? Yeah, well, just one little point. I'm, I'm not a translator, as you know, no. But I, I find it interesting that I, I think translators are quite incredible people in that they have to be, they have to have empathy for one thing, because you're, you're actually moving, you're more than a tourist guide. You're, you're taking people into that world and giving them as much as you think they can. So that person is at home in, in both, right? Uh, that, so not everyone can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's immensely satisfying. Once you've completed, complete translating a poem, it's immensely satisfying. Yeah. For me to myself. Yeah, I've done this. It's, it was impossible, but I did it anyway. I kind of. <laughs> I think we've, we've uh, run out of time for the session, so thank you very much again for uh, joining us and also special thanks to our facilitators today, Dr. Oikibeng and also Chiu uh, Ropeng.
Yeah? Uh, all right, thank you. I hope uh, it was very beneficial. I certainly gained a lot from this conversation. And I hope to see you guys around in uh, the rest of GTLF. Thank you very much.